Thank you, Arlene. Today's sermon is going to be a little bit different um, than Joshua. These last two weeks, we've had a break. We did the Orlando report, and then we had to, what was the other one? My mind's fried. I want a Sunday. That's right. That was just last week. We did the Orlando report, then I want a Sunday, and then this coming Sunday is the dedication Sunday, and then the Sunday after that, I'm actually going to be gone out of town again, and so there's going to be basically four weeks here where there's two weeks off, two weeks off, then one week on, and then two weeks off with, with our normal series, and thought, you know what, rather than getting to Joshua just this one time, we're going to do something a little bit different. So I'm going to do a standalone sermon today on this topic of, well, this is a sermon title of God is Love, Why Do I Hurt? And it was Valentine's Day week, and uh, just thinking about that, some of us, we love Valentine's Day week, others, uh, others of us hate it, right? We'll be honest with you, and I found that it doesn't matter where you are in life, it doesn't matter what relationships you have, at some point you begin to wonder, okay, does this person I'm in a relationship with, do they really, do they really love me? Do they really, maybe do they even like me, right? These are questions that we ask, and sometimes we ask this of God, when struggles come, does God, God of love, does, does that God love me? My dad, uh, my dad is having an audit by the IRS. And anybody here ever been audited by the IRS? Anybody? Okay, a couple, yeah, thanks, Carolyn, right? It's a pain. We had a pastor in our church in Omaha, he got audited, what, twice in a row? Something like that. So my dad's going through an IRS audit. And it's, it's a pain, it's not very much fun, and of course, there's always a concern, what are you going to do? And I was talking to him this week, a couple weeks ago, about this whole thing and all the paperwork he had to send in, and it's just, it's just a nightmare, is really what it is. It's not much fun. And then, of course, the concern of what the IRS can and cannot do to you as a company. And so he's, honestly, he's a little nervous about this. Honestly, he is. Um, but I told him, to kind of encourage him a little bit, I told him of the, of the company that they did frozen meals, and they were audited as well, but really, what was the IRS going to do? Because all their assets were already frozen. <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing to be concerned about. You're welcome. We were butchering a cow with Dave on Friday, right? We had two beefs we butchered with Dave on Friday, and that was a good time, but there was, there was some utter destruction that went on a little bit. It was okay. Oh, get him off the stage, people. Make it stop. All right. Sorry. That's a dairy cow joke, right? That was a long sermon. Are we done? We're done. All right. My wife says I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Love you all. You guys are awesome. Okay, moving on. All right, let's come on back here. If God is love, why do I hurt? Love is confusing. It really is, okay? And I'm sure you've had times in your life when you think the same thing. Love, frankly, is confusing. People who say they love us oftentimes hurt us, and not only them, it seems like the very God who says he loves us ends up hurting us. And today we're going to discover what we can learn about God's love as we go through the hurts of life. It doesn't matter who we are, what we do, we're going to experience some hurts. And in the middle of those things, we may have some questions. God, what are you doing? What's happening? What, what, what's all this about? Before we start, we're going to open up with a word of prayer and we're going to dive right in this. God, I thank you for our time together today, for those who are here and today we're going to be talking about kind of a hard thing, which is reconciling your love with the hurts we experience. And Lord, I pray you give us wisdom. Help us as we talk about this today. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a simple outline in your bulletin there to kind of help you track along with us. A little fill in the blank is going to help you a little bit. Uh, I'm going to start out with the story of, of my grandpa, my grandpa bear. This sermon came from a life experience that I had when, when I was in college as an 18-year-old, and that life experience centered around my grandpa bear, and something that happened to him. There's, I'm going to show you a little map here. See the two arrows, one towards the top, the one towards the bottom? The one towards the top is where I was, was, where I was raised. Little house just north of Highway 2, the same Highway 2 that goes through Grand Island. You get on that Highway 2, you grab all the way across, you get halfway across Iowa, right on the Appanoose Wayne County line, which is this road right there. That's the Appanoose Wayne County border. And that's where I was raised for 16 years of my life. I lived there just about a mile and a half north of Highway 2. To the south, that's my grandpa's farm. 
That's where he lived his whole life. He's been in the family for, well, since 1878. That farm's been in the family. Still has the original farmhouse on it. It's not used as a farmhouse, but the structure's still there, still standing, use it for storage right now. And so as a kid, I was over there a lot. Uh, we burned wood in our house, and we was always over at Grandpa's cutting wood. He'd bring the John Deere B with the old bus saw and the long belt drive. You guys remember seeing some of those things? No blade guards on these things. Two-foot blade. My mom and dad let seven kids run around that tractor. I don't know what they were thinking. All right? So we all survived. We made it. But that's how close I was to my Grandpa, proximity-wise. And so then I got to grow up and did a lot with him. In fact, my dad called me. I don't I think it was three weeks ago, the roof that I did, the very first roof that I helped do was a garage roof of grandpa's, and he gave me a hammer and some nails and said, go at it, we're going to shingle this thing, right? And so we were up there, that roof needs to be replaced finally. <laughs> yeah, finally needs to be replaced. That was 30 some years ago. I wasn't even 10 years old up there on a the roof with my grandpa, carrying just, I could carry about a third of a bundle of shingles at a time up on this roof. And then he gave me my little, little nail apron and a hammer, and me and my three brothers, well, two brothers, actually, just the three older ones, we were up there on the roof helping him shingle that. It was just a great time. In my high school years, when I was 16, I spent a winter mechanically restoring a John Deere B with him, a 1948 John Deere B. I spent the whole winter with him, and at the time, I was a big brother to a kid in our town, and he came along, too. Little Dougie Martin came along, and we spent a lot of time in that garage restoring that John Deere B. A lot of great memories with my grandpa. I realized the first time that my grandpa didn't like me, and it was around a church steeple. He called me up, and we there's a little town called Jerome, Iowa, and their church steeple needed painted, and he got the job because he was a contractor as well, did part-time contracting. So I got there, and I said, how are we going to do it? He said, well, he said, our neighbor here, Mark Haynes, he's going to hold the extension ladder, which is resting on the roof, leaning against the steeple, and you're going to climb it and paint it. Yeah, right. He said, no, no, right. And I said, that was the first moment I realized my grandpa really didn't like me that much. So I literally had my arm wrapped around painting my arm while holding on to this thing because I was terrified. Heights is not my deal. I could tell you stories all day long. My wife knows I could tell you stories all day long. What I want you to understand is that I had a close relationship with my grandpa. A very close relationship with my grandpa. I mean, he was just the guy. There was a couple years when my parents, um, who jumped around from church to church to church, we went to seven different churches as a kid growing up, and there was a few years there where my parents didn't go to church. Grandma and Grandpa took us every Sunday. All of us kids, we went with them every Sunday. Grandma was a Sunday school teacher. Grandpa was a Sunday school teacher. He was a deacon at the church, very involved. So spiritually, my grandpa had a large impact on my life, not just physically. I was super close to my grandpa. There were 60 years between us, 60 years to the month. He was born September 9, 1919. I was born September 24, 1979. So I always knew how old Grandpa was. All I had to do was plus 60. And uh, it was, we always had that, that special relationship. We had our birthday parties together every year. I had a birthday party with my grandpa and my other brother who was born September 11. And that was just one of our, one of our bonds. So I went to college when I was 18. My grandfather would have been, well, I was just about to turn 18 at the time. I went in August, would have turned 18 in September. My grandpa at the time was, of course, 60 years older than me. Okay, so he was 77 years old at that time. And two weeks after getting to school, I got a call from my sister who lived there in campus. And some of you heard this story, many of you have not. But my grandpa had been in an accident that day. They were on the farm. And my dad was driving a, driving a semi-trailer, and they were unloading some equipment down at, my, down at my grandpa's farm, storing some stuff there. And, and dad was backing up the trailer. I didn't realize that grandpa had walked behind, and the semi-tractor trailer knocked grandpa down. The bumper didn't hit him and knocked him down the ground. He was 77 at the time. Well, you know those things have a low bumper, and he got his arms up in there and hooked on the bumper. But then the wheel ran up on his leg, and then it slid for a couple of feet before dad got it stopped. And the weight of that just tore his leg up bad. He didn't have any retirement. He was self-employed, a hobby. For, you know, he farmed a little bit, 120 acres. He raised a few sheep. And then he did construction. I mean, he did part-time jobs, carpentry jobs. That's what he did. And so here was this, frankly, the old man who was the sole income, the sole provider for the family, a little bit of Social Security, not a lot, in the hospital now with a leg that they wondered they'd have to amputate. And he was there for a long time and on morphine and the morphine made him angry and he didn't recognize grandma and he'd throw bedpans and this was a side of grandpa that we'd never seen before. And for the first time in my life, I'm away from my grandfather who I was extremely close to and all this is happening. And I thought, God, what are you doing? Here's a man that contributed to my life in a spiritual way, contributed to the life of Awana kids. He was an Awana leader. 
for years and years, Sunday school teacher for years and years, the sole provider again, and God, what are you doing? In the middle of that, I hurt. In the middle of that, I wondered, God, what in the world are you doing? Some of you have experienced hurts like that, those times when you wonder, God, what are you doing? Those bad hurts when you just think, what's, what's happening, what is going on here? In the middle of those times, we ask questions. And one of the questions I asked was, okay, God, do you, do you really love us? To allow these things to happen, do you really love us? And that's kind of the first question we ask sometimes is, does God love me? As we're experiencing a hurt, as we're experiencing that trauma, we ask that question, and we do that in our relationships all the time. We have a spouse who, who does things. We're like, does, does my spouse really love me? How could they do this to me? How could my friend do this to me? How could, my, how could my boss stab me in the back? I thought we had a relationship. Do these people not care? God, do you? Do you not care? God, do you? Are you there? Do you really love me? Well, in his word, we're going to see a few things of God's love here. Just reading through, and God took me to the scriptures, which is always the best way to place, place to start whenever you're wondering about God. And there's, there's three things we're going to talk about with God where he is proven some different characteristics of his love. And the first thing we're going to look at are, are the credentials of God's love. Or when you go to his word, we can see the credentials. So even when nothing else matches up, okay, then I can say, all right, God, I, my life circumstances don't seem to match this, but this is what you say, so somehow I've got to make this thing fit. Let's look first at the credentials of God's love. And, and in his word, we read in, we read in 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Well, because God is love. So God reassured me the first in all this is that, look, I know that what you're going through stinks, but you've got to remember, I am love. That's what I am. That's who I am. 2 Corinthians 13 says this, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Our God, the credentials of our God is that he is a God of love. No matter what's going on in life, we have to remember that God does not change. He is a God of love. And then, of course, there's a certainty of his love that comes with that, the fact that that love's never going to change. And we look in Micah chapter 7, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. Our God delights in a love that continues forever. Forever. And then, of course, we go to the passage in Romans 8, this great passage where it says, I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. As that 17-year-old about ready to turn 18, and then even as an 18-year-old, I look at that, especially that phrase, nor things present, nor things to come. I sit there and look at that situation my grandpa was going through. And I think, God, God, I hope this is true. Because at the time I wondered. And yet in the middle of that, God showed up, right? I mean, there I was at college and this accident happened. I had no way home. I had no car. I didn't have any transportation. And I go up to my dorm room and, and guys, I'm in tears. I have to go and leave my sister's house. And, and the guys in that dorm, I'm a freshman. These guys don't even know me. They said, Bear, we're going to drive you home tonight. They drove the night through to get me home to be there. That was God showing me a little bit of love in a big way from guys who didn't even know me and drove the night through so they could be back at class at 7 o'clock the next morning and yet get me home where I needed to be. And that was an amazing thing. But in the middle of that, God, this, this present hurts and I don't know what's coming and God says, I know. But you gotta understand, none of that's gonna separate you from me. There's a certainty of God's love that we have and then of course there's a confirmation that God gives us. <laughs> the Bible says no greater love is this than a man lay down his life for his friend, right? But think about this. God didn't just lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies. Let's look at these verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He loved the whole world. And we understand and we know people in this world who frankly, they hate God. We know people like that. And God still loved them enough that he sent his son to die for them. Ephesians 2 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. What is grace? 
It's giving someone something good that he or she does not deserve. That is God's love showing us grace because of his love. We have such a confirmation God's love. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you've been healed. And that first phrase, he himself bore our sins. Want greater confirmation of love than that. And then 1 Peter 3, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Again, what greater love than to die for somebody? That's a God that loves us. That's a God who chose to love us. In 1 John 4, 10, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And verse 19, we love because he first loved us. I love that part. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. What greater confirmation could I have? So in the middle of that hurt that I was going through, okay, God, I know you're a God of love. You promised that your love's never gonna change and God, you show me over and over again you love me, but God, how does this fit? How does this circumstance work? What do I do with this? Why do I hurt? God, if you're a God of love, if you're the God you say you are, why then do I hurt? Why do you allow me to go through this? There's a couple things I wanna consider as we look at this. The first question answer we wanna do is why does a God who loves me allow this to happen to me, Right? I think it's a fair question. Job asked that question. Sometimes we ask that question, God, if you're a God of love, if you're so awesome as a God, why do you let this happen to me? Why am I going through this? What are you doing? And then we say to ourselves that this is not my idea of a loving God. And you know what? That's right. Sometimes it's not our idea of a loving God. And, and then God in response looks at us and says, yeah, you're right. This is not your idea of a loving God. This is not. It's not your idea of a loving God. And so what needs to happen here is that we have to transition into what the correct idea of a loving God should be. We say, this is not my idea, and God says, you're right. This is not your idea. And let's look at Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, I'm just a little precursor here. We, we see Nebuchadnezzar coming off of a time that God used in his life, an affliction that God used in his life. We're going to look at that further on down in, in the message here, but in the end of this, Nebuchadnezzar realized some things, and we're going to look at the end first because sometimes we just do things backwards around here, but Daniel 4, verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? What have you done? Nebuchadnezzar, coming off of a time of affliction in his life, recognized that, you know what? That was a bad time for me. But God was still God. It didn't change who he was. And none of us can really, in reality, none of us can ask, God, what have you done? And so God challenged me in that. Just as he challenged Job, you go to Job chapter 40 and 41. I mean, those are great chapters that Job wrestles with God a little bit. And finally, Job, he covers his mouth with his hands. says, I will speak no more. Because he recognizes nobody can say to God, what have you done? Ecclesiastes 7, consider the work of God who can make straight what he has made crooked. The day of prosperity be joyful and the day of adversity consider God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. There's a time in our lives when, when we don't know the answers. When we don't know what's happening, we don't know what's going on and God says, I am using those for you because sometimes you just need to trust me. And it's hard sometimes when you don't know what's coming to just trust God. And God says, are you going to trust me? Are you going to know that I am a God of love, that I am the one in control, that I know what I'm doing? And that's difficult. But that's what God wants from us. And it hurts. He exposes those times to us. And Romans 8, 28, this is a great verse. We use it over and over again. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. I love that. 
Because it never says that the beginning is good, but we, said we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Ecclesiastes says it this way, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Better is the end than its beginning. Go back to Romans 8, 28. Sometimes the beginning stinks, doesn't it? And sometimes the middle is even worse. But I had a friend, Steve Flagg, he spoke here at my installation Sunday. Steve Flagg was the guy who spoke here from Omaha. And Steve told me as I went through a hard time in my life, he says, look, he said, in the end, it's going to be better. And if it's not better, it's not the end. It's a pretty good paraphrase. That's a pretty good paraphrase. You know what? Romans 8, 28 is true. God causes all things to work together for good because Ecclesiastes is also true. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And in the middle, we've got to remember that. We have to remember that. So what? Well, question number two is that, well, then God, how can my hurt be good? You say the end of this is going to be better. You say you're going to work it for good, but God, how can this be good? What exactly are you trying to do in the middle of this? Well, I'm going to suggest two things. There may be more, but I'm going to suggest two things to you. Two things that God tries to do in our hurt. Number one, God uses our hurts to reveal sin. Our hurts, our afflictions, our trials, whatever you want to call them, can reveal sin in our lives. Look first at Psalm 119. For the psalmist is writing this, he says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. God used a hurt to bring about some spiritual healing. Think about David who lost his son. David and Bathsheba, that adulterous relationship they had. And as a result of that, their son lost his life. God used that time to do, to do what? To reveal sin in David's life. To show him that. And you think, well, then an innocent life was lost. Yes, it was. Sin complicates things. That's for sure. But sin can be revealed in times of affliction. God uses affliction to reveal that. God uses a hurt. 1 Corinthians 11, we read this a lot on Communion Sunday because it's that passage on the Lord's table. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. God uses hurt to reveal sin. And maybe it's yours, and maybe it's someone else's. I don't know, but God uses hurt to reveal sin. And so that's something, of course, a question. God, in this middle of this time, what are you doing? Why is this happening? And I think this is true. But I think even more than that, and yes, God uses hurt to reveal sin, but I think even more than that, in the end, God uses hurt. Well, actually, let's finish this one up here in Daniel 4, verse 32. This is God talking to Nebuchadnezzar prior to Nebuchadnezzar saying that you are God. No one can say your hand. No one can ask, what have you done? God says to Nebuchadnezzar these words, you shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. He put King Nebuchadnezzar through a seven year trial, seven year period of time until Nebuchadnezzar recognized that God was God and King Nebuchadnezzar was not. And he said, at the end of the time, I lifted my eyes to heaven. And for us, sometimes we lift our eyes to heaven because what happens is that that hurt in the end, God uses to direct our praise to him. Yes, it reveals sin, but it also, God uses it to also direct our praise to him in the middle of those. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. The Apostle Paul writes, so to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Twice, he says at the very beginning, to keep me from becoming conceited, and at the end, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now, I don't have a pride problem. I recognize that, and I'm proud of it. But some people out here may. You're welcome. <laughs> you know what? God uses these things in our life to direct our praise to him. God uses hurts so that in the end we turn to him. So the end we recognize his hand is at work. In the end we recognize he's a God that no matter what, he loves us. The doctors didn't think grandpa would ever walk again. 
They figured he'd be in a wheelchair the rest of his life. And of course, the family wasn't sure what would happen with all the medical bills. How he and grandma were going to continue to live on this farm. The semi-tractor trailer that my dad was driving happened to be owned by a company, a pretty good-sized company, and dad was on their behalf, was driving on their behalf that day, delivering some stuff from Buffalo, Missouri. That company was insured. They paid the medical bills for my grandpa. And they gave him a settlement so that he could retire better than he'd ever, better off than he'd ever been in his whole life. My grandmother and my grandpa didn't have the greatest of marriages because grandpa was always gone. Grandma's love language was quality time. Grandpa was now at home with his wife. Their relationship became closer than I'd ever seen it become. The accident softened grandpa. For the first time in my life, I heard my grandpa say, I love you. I'd never heard my grandfather say those words. He read books such as Philip Yancey, What's So Amazing About Grace, and he began to develop a relationship with God, even as close as he was, that was greater than he'd ever had before. And two years after the accident, he walked down the aisle as my best man at my wedding, using a cane, but he stood beside me when I said my vows to my beautiful bride. Did it hurt? You betcha. Did God love me? <laughs> Guaranteed. And I look at that and I see what God did in the middle of that and I praise God for it because of how he revealed himself. And I don't know what hurts you guys are going through. I know some of what some of you are going through, but I do not know, all, I do not know really all of it. Guys, I know you're going, to feel, you're going to feel some hurts. And you're going to wonder, God, what are you doing? But in the middle of that, you've got to trust that God's there. That God's working. And this is what I learned. I learned that I hurt because God is love. I learned that I hurt because God is love. He uses those hurts to bring me closer to him in a way that never would have happened without it in a way that he could be glorified, you know, again, in a way that never could have happened without that. I hurt because God is love. And in the middle of that hurt, I can actually feel God's love more than without it. So then, of course, the question is, have you felt God's love by seeing the good in your hurt? And it takes time. Sometimes it does. It takes time. It takes a little bit for you to look back and say, God, what were you doing in that? And, and begin to add all those things up. But guys, let me tell you, this I know. I know that God's a good God who promises his love for us is unchanging, who promises that nothing can separate us, and he's promised, you know what, in the end it's gonna be better. Dr. Emerson Eggridge tells a story of a young man that he met at a conference who was born crippled. Couldn't really use his hands, had speech impediments, and yet, in the middle of his life, he was, he was just one of those guys who was just faithful to God and his beliefs and praising God. And, and Dr. Eggridge, ha he asked him, he said, how have you been able to maintain that? And he says, well, he says, here's what I think. He says, when I was born, he says, I, I figure that God put me in an oven, the oven of life. And he was, his, his legs were crippled and, and Mercy Nagers tried to describe what it was like, you know, with his wrists and his ankles twisted, sitting there. And, and he said, I envision someday God's gonna open that oven door and look at me, pull it open and say, well done. I want God to look at me someday and say, well done. And to do that, I gotta stay faithful to God just as he's faithful to me. But sometimes God uses the oven of life to get us well done. Lord, I'm grateful for how you use the hurts of our life to reveal brokenness within us. But you also use the hurts of life to reveal just how awesome you are. Thanks, God. Thank you for those years that I had again with my grandfather. With that moment I had of him being able to walk down the aisle and stand beside me as I said those vows to my bride. 
in a way that we thought was going to be impossible. The way you healed his marriage, the way you strengthened him spiritually. And God, I don't know what hurts being felt out here in the congregation, but I pray that you would use those hurts to strengthen life relationships between husbands and wives and, and fathers and, and children and moms and kids. Lord, I pray that you would use those things to allow us to see just how mighty you are. Allow us to see that you are good. Father, thank you for being good. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.